All right, welcome to today's uh, Catholic Charities USA online webinar. We're excited to uh, proceed and get moving here. I'm going to transfer back here and uh, move on to a few housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Zach Halen. I'm the Strategic Director for Disaster Operations here at Catholic Charities USA, and we are always thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, really spotlight and rely on the strength of uh, subject matter experts uh, within our network to help share knowledge with one another. Uh, we feel it's one of the most important functions that we can serve here uh, at the national office, and so today uh, is no different. And uh, I think you'll be thrilled to hear more about some of our presenters here uh, just shortly as we dive into the topic of disaster case management, uh, specifically transitioning uh, to disaster case management and learn a lot about not only that topic, but a lot of the resources and tools we have available from CCUSA uh, to help you in uh, a lot of those tasks and functions uh, that you'll be asked to do when it comes to disaster case management. Uh, but before getting into all that, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted online to the members portal uh, as well as our YouTube channel. And uh, you'll get an email following uh, this uh, presentation uh, with, uh, I think, some survey questions. And then once that video is uh, uh, uploaded, we'll also make sure you know where to find that. Uh, you'll see here that you have a hand feature. Uh, if you want to raise your hand and notify that you want to verbally ask a question, we'll be pausing at a couple points uh, throughout the presentation as well as at the end of the presentation uh, to allow folks to have the chance to ask questions um, uh, verbally and have a response from, from our presenters. Um, you also have the option of typing in those questions. Uh, there's a chat box feature and you can uh, direct your questions directly to me and I can help collate those and offer them back up uh, to our presenters during those Q&A sessions as well, if you'd like to avoid uh, speaking uh, on, on part of the recorded webinar. Uh, so that option is yours. Uh, if you do choose to want to ask your question verbally, there's a, uh, a little button that we push on our end to help unmute your line. Uh, I think it provides you a, a code to enter. Uh, if not, once, once that button is clicked, you are good to go, and you can go ahead and ask that question, and you will be heard. Um, if you have any other difficulties or challenges, uh, you know, throughout uh, the presentation, feel free again to just type those in. Uh, the presentation is available in PDF form uh, right here within the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, you should find that there's a handout in the handout section of your module where you can download that. Uh, so you do already have that available to you. Um, additionally, you can email questions if you're uncomfortable using the chat box feature. Uh, my email is listed there. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, hear a little bit about our presenters today. I'm going to start by introducing Diane Elio to you. Uh, she is the Reporting and Compliance Manager of, <coughs> of um, uh, Disaster Case Manager for Project Comeback uh, Texas uh, with Catholic Charities USA. Uh, from 2005 to 2018, Diane uh, served as the Emergency Assistance Disaster Recovery and Ecumenical Outreach Manager for Catholic Charities at the Archdiocese of Denver. Uh, the Disaster Recovery Manager portion of her title was added in 2013 in response to massive flooding in the state. Uh, what was uh, described at the time as flooding of biblical proportions. Uh, many rivers rose 16 feet in just 30 minutes. A grant from Catholic Charities USA as well as the Disaster Case and Management Grant from the State of Colorado uh, for Catholic Charities of Denver in the leadership role for the long-term recovery and case management for the entire disaster. Uh, so please um, put your hands together uh, silently from the comfort of your laptop for having Diane with us today. Uh, we additionally, co-presenting along with Diane, have Julianne Pinelli. Uh, Julianne, as I flip over to her, uh, her bio here, has worked in the field of disaster human services in the New York City area for over 15 years. She first served as a disaster case manager for the Salvation Army, working with those affected by 9-11, and then with Hurricane Katrina survivors who relocated to New York City. For the past 11 years, Julianne has worked for uh, Catholic Charities Community Services of the Archdiocese of New York in several roles, including working on multi-agency disaster preparedness and planning initiatives, the disaster case management supervisor overseeing 
three Hudson Valley counties after Hurricanes Irene and Tropical Storm Lee, as well as the Program Manager and Training and Resource Coordinator for the federally funded New York State Disaster Case Management Program for Superstorm Sandy. Um, she has a plethora of experience, has been invited, both Diane and Julianne have, uh, by FEMA to help provide disaster case management training all across the country and its territories. Uh, so without any further uh, pause on my part, Julianne, go ahead and take us away. Sure, can you hear me okay? Certainly. All right, so I'm Julianne Kelly. Um, and our learning objectives for this webinar today are for our participants to be able to explain the impact of disaster on their communities and on the agency, for participants to be able to distinguish the core differences between everyday case management and disaster case management, and for participants to be able to understand the timing of transitioning from response to recovery through disaster case management. And Diane will talk to you about disaster basics. Thank you, Julianne. So just so we're all on the same page, uh, a good definition of a disaster is it's a serious disruption that occurs for, for a relatively short time. The uh, impact is widespread and there's uh, enormous economic or environmental loss and impacts and really it exceeds the ability of the affected community uh, to cope using its own resources. Disasters can be natural or man-made, and they can be declared or non-declared disasters. And what does that mean to be declared? So in a non-declared disaster, the post-disaster uh, relief and recovery needs, they don't exceed the capacity of the county or the state to respond with their resources. And it does not meet the established th threshold for federal resources. So in a non-declared disaster, the resources will be limited. As opposed to a declared disaster, which happens when the destruction overwhelms the community and the local government may request help from the state. And then if the state is overwhelmed, the governor has the um, ability to request help from the federal government. And the president may approve a federal disaster declaration for the state. So examples of what might be considered a disaster hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, wildfires, earthquakes, lava eruptions, tsunamis, terrorist attacks, industrial accidents. Um, many of you today on the call may have experienced some of these or may in the future. And I'd like to talk to you about the phases of a disaster and where response and recovery fit in. If you look to the right and the red starburst, that's where the incident takes place. And the response phase, which is that initial contact to help um, survivors, is takes place in the response phase, which is usually like, uh, Julianne will go into it a little uh, further, but that's the immediate um, activities that take place usually could be from the impact of the disaster to up to three, four months. Then we move into the recovery um, phase of a disaster, which of course is a little more long-term where long-term case management happens. After that is mitigation, um, which is planning and making things a little bit better for the future. So the impact of the next disaster if it should occur, will not be so enormous. And then also to be mindful of preparedness and mitigation and preparedness should always be taking place. Um, you know, hopefully um, another incident won't happen, but uh, with mitigation and preparedness, the impact of uh, the next incident will be much less. 
So the next topic that I'd like to review is called the sequence of disaster delivery. So the sequence of delivery, it must be followed when providing assistance to disaster survivors following an incident. And the whole point is that we really want to ensure that uh, a survivor receives all the assistance to which they are legally entitled. We like to look at the sequence of delivery in both non-declared and declared. So let's just take a look at this image. In a non-declared disaster, um, two things that really stand out is that um, assistance always begins and ends with our voluntary, or voluntary organizations. And I like to imagine along the bottom of the slide could be a timeline arrow. So in a non-declared disaster, it could be from the point of impact. And let's say it could be in a non-declared disaster. It could be more than a year, but let's just say um, when we talk about declared, it'll be longer. But for this um, situation in a non-declared disaster, again, it'll start out with the voluntary organizations doing the mass feeding, sheltering, doing some of that emergency assistance, um, helping with immediate medical needs, the cleanup, the muck out with groups like Team Rubicon, the CERT teams will be involved. Um, then moving along on that sequence of delivery, uh, a survivor's insurance and personal resources will be kicking in to help them in their recovery efforts, whether it be homeowners, renters, flood, earthquake, fire, or some other type of insurance or personal resources. And again, it ends with the voluntary organizations with disaster case management, some rehousing, and some long-term recovery groups forming, even in a non-declared disaster. So if we take a look at a declared disaster, here's the difference. Again, if you imagine that imaginary timeline, um, you know, for Julianne, for Superstorm Sandy, you might have from zero from the date of impact, it could be up to 10, maybe 15 years, depending on the disaster. But again, the thing that I'd like to point out is that it always starts again with the voluntary organizations and it ends with the voluntary organizations. What is different in a declared disaster is that there are additional resources. And if you look at the purple and blue boxes, those additional resources come in the form of FEMA programs. So if we look at the first purple box, uh, you've got temporary housing, some home repairs, medical, dental, and funeral assistance. And then there's also SBA programs, the Small Business Association, which is not just for small businesses. Um, individual homeowners can also apply, and it's for real property loans at a very, very low interest rate. So that's a wonderful way to help people um, into recovery and also some other FEMA programs that assist with personal property, um, moving in storage, transportation, and some group flood insurance. But again, starts with the voluntary organizations and ends with the voluntary organizations with the importance here with disaster case management, rehousing, and long-term recovery groups at the very end of that sequence. And the, the one thing I think I'd like to point out on that sequence of delivery, I think there's always so much pressure on an agency um, that, you know, why are you not spending, you know, all this financial donations to come in at the beginning? And I think um, this, this particular visual really helps, you know, indicate that there are other resources out there that should be used, um, you know, because in the end, it really will be us, the voluntary organizations that are gonna be helping. So that's why it's kind of important to hold back some of those resources because there's other things to tap into before you get to that point. So let's take a look at the impact of a disaster on the community. So of course, in any disaster, the possibility would be damaged and destroyed home. Uh, physical injuries. Um, the worst, of course, is loss of life. There'll be interruptions in water, electricity, gas, other utility services. Um, transportation is going to be an issue. 
mail service. Uh, schools may not be in session. Um, there'll be a breakdown perhaps in internet and phone service. Um, oftentimes, there'll be a loss of people's jobs and families can be separated. And of course, our survivors are facing uh, challenges as well. Of course, their homes uh, damaged, homelessness, like we talked about, they're gonna experience lost wages perhaps. They've lost personal property. Their vehicles may have been flooded or burned. Um, again, we talked about the loss of life. They're, they're, they're gonna be feeling perhaps just a loss of control, uh, loss of finances, you know, other challenges. How many times do they have to tell their story? It's so challenging. Um, just really overall, just emotional roller coasters are what are many of the challenges faced by our survivors. And, you know, we as agencies during the disasters, you know, we can always anticipate an increased need for our services. Um, you know, clients that are already receiving our services, it's a pretty good chance they're going to have additional disaster related needs. And you may see people who have never asked for assistance of any kind before. They're really forced to seek help in a disaster. So there's so many ways um, we as agencies can engage and participate in that recovery process. But really the most valuable service that you can provide is to expand those case management capabilities to really help our survivors access those resources we talked about in that sequence of delivery to really help with their disaster related needs. Well, uh, Diane, thanks so much for kind of laying that groundwork. Uh, uh, it's very important to get us to a point where we can kind of dive deep into transitioning into disaster case management. Uh, we understand that uh, some of this uh, content may be review for many of you, uh, but also new as well. Uh, to other portions of you. So we want to go ahead and take a pause here and see what questions folks may have thus far into the webinar. As a reminder, you can uh, direct those uh, to me uh, within the chat feature. Uh, you can also raise your hand using the GoToWebinar uh, kind of user interface, and I can go ahead and see that and unmute your line so that you can address the question uh, to Julianne and or Diane to address. All right, Diane, we have no questions, so uh, go ahead and uh, you and Julianne uh, carry forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach. So let's let's move into talking about the importance of coordination with other voluntary agencies. So establishing partnerships and coordinating assistance is really crucial during all phases of that disaster cycle, whether it be response, recovery, mitigation, and preparedness. Really, like the best time to build those relationships is not during the disaster. Um, in a perfect world, the best time to have those build those relationships is during the blue sky non-disaster days. But, but even saying that, pretty amazing partnerships can form in the midst of a disaster, and they can last long after the recovery process is complete. And it's important uh, to coordinate with other disaster partners because it really helps minimize the duplication of services and effort. Um, so important to share resources that, um, you know, a lot of people will donate at the beginning, but those resources won't last forever. So they can become very scarce. Um, it's great to really communicate best practices in the community. Um, kind of some consistency is, is great. And then again, like we talked about before, as a challenge for a survivor, it gets kind of old telling that same story. It can, be, can really re-traumatize. So that's why it's really, really important. I did have an asterisk here that, and you know, anytime you're sharing information with disaster partners will only be allowed when the appropriate release forms are signed with the uh, survivors. And again, coordination with other uh, service providers. And these might be agencies that are not even providing disaster case management. So um, an individual can have a disaster case manager and still work with other service providers. Um, communication and information sharing between DCM, disaster case managers, 
and staff of other agencies can happen again, like I mentioned, once those release forms are signed. A disaster case manager works on really disaster-related needs and goals, while other agencies may be working on pre-existing or non-disaster needs or goals. And uh, the collaboration between a disaster case management and the staff at other agencies are really to help um, assist our survivors with their needs and goals. And they may overlap, which is fine. And then if we start to think about coordination among other disaster case manager agencies, um, in many communities, it may not just be Catholic Charities who's providing the disaster case management, but an affected household should only have one disaster case manager. And if there's a federally funded DCMP, there may be other large and small agencies also providing long-term disaster case management services, but they may not be uh, funded by the same source. And coordination with other DCM agencies really requires communication in order, again, um, keep, keep talking about this as minimizing duplication, sharing resources, communicating our best practices. And again, I said it before, survivors won't have to tell their stories umpteen times. And, and in many areas, they use um, CAN, which is a coordinated assistance network uh, shared database. The government can't get into that. It's just really for uh, nonprofits. And in some other areas, for instance, in the state of Texas, we use uh, DART, which is a disaster assistance uh, tool, and it's uh, similar to CAN. So, but CAN has been around for a long time and is a well-known shared database. If we think about disaster partners, um, the real thing that I, I just want to emphasize is you're just not in this alone. Um, there's so many organizations and groups that are out there helping. We've got you know, our government partners with FEMA, our state and local. Um, in FEMA, you know, if you have a FEMA VAL, which is your voluntary agency liaison, um, that's a, a, per, a wonderful relationship because a VAL knows who most of the players are and can really help uh, be a connector. You know, you've got the private sector, um, you know, Home Depot is a wonderful partner, Panera, um, Lowe's, Ace Hardware. I'm sure you've got a lot of examples in your own local area. You've got your non-government agencies. Um, you've got your faith-based organizations like Salvation Army and UMCOR, United Methodist Community and Relief. You've got churches, Catholic, Baptist, um, synagogues. You've got your national and local VOADs. So VOADs being voluntary organizations active in disaster, which um, I highly encourage you to always be involved in your own VOAD, your state VOAD, and your local VOADs. And of course, Catholic Charities USA is um, always going to be your partner. And Catholic partners, you know, you've got your Catholic churches who are great to help with, um, you know, second collections. The Knights of Columbus are um, such a strong group to help in any way needed. St. Vincent de Paul, um, they have a beautiful house in a box program. Um, you've got your CYO organizations, Catholic schools and colleges. And, you know, other Catholic Charities members in the network are such valuable partners. Either um, they're so generous with sharing their experiences, um, sharing their own staff and deployment. And, um, yeah, so, again, there you've got so many partners when it comes to disasters. So I'm going to um, send this on over to Julianne to talk about disaster case management. Thanks, Diane. So um, before we even talk about disaster case management, I want to spend a little time talking about disaster case work. You can go to that next slide, Zach. So in my experience, disaster case work isn't always talked about by name, but the function of this early intervention is often something that happens after a disaster. And it typically happens um, 
where it transitions into longer term disaster case management. But sometimes disaster casework actually after that happens, it's the end of services to people affected by disaster because the need just isn't there to warrant longer term disaster case management. So during this disaster casework process, Disaster caseworkers provide information and referral to clients, and they link clients to services and resources to address their immediate and urgent needs. So these are things that a client needs typically that day or that week, urgent needs and immediate needs. And so because of this short-term interaction, continuity of care from that same caseworker is not necessary. So if you think of services at a disaster recovery center or a MARC, which stands for multi-agency resource center, um, if you think of services there where a client might come in and receive services early on after the disaster, maybe they meet with someone to sign them up for FEMA, they get a toiletry bag from the Red Cross, and then maybe they come in to, again two weeks later. They could, still, they could meet with a different person a different staff member, a different disaster caseworker, and still find out, you know, any updates on their FEMA case. They could still get a gift card for maybe gas if they needed it that day or that week. Um, they might still be able to get a Salvation Army closing voucher. But again, because those are more immediate and short-term needs, that continuity of care from the same caseworker isn't necessary. They can work with someone different. And the disaster caseworker can also assess the needs for longer term disaster case management services. And if that need is kept track of for all of the people who do come to a disaster recovery center or a mark, those numbers could be the reason why a disaster case management program starts because this shows the need. Next. Okay, so disaster case management comes several months later typically, um, or depending on the funding source, it might not come for many months. Um, and it's a critical component of long-term recovery. It's the process where a skilled helper, that's the disaster case manager, partners one-on-one -on -one with a disaster-affected individual or household to achieve realistic goals for their recovery. Now, this extends beyond the immediate and urgent needs, and it's comprehensive and holistic. The disaster case manager looks at the whole household and all of the possible ways that household was affected by the disaster or what is standing in the way of their recovery. Continuity of care from the same disaster case manager over time is imperative because this is how you build trust and this is how you get the full picture of the client and their household that you're working with. And the disaster case manager is there to help the client navigate the complex system of disaster assistance and provide support along the way. Next. So this is just a visual aid to show you where disaster case work and disaster case management are typically found within the disaster cycle that Diane had talked about. So disaster case work is seen in the response phase and then disaster case management comes during the recovery phase. I think there's a couple, yeah, you can go on to the next one. So what does a disaster case manager do? Clients have to know about the program, so there might be some outreach um, or there might be direct referrals from a disaster recovery center or mark um, or from another partner agency or from 211. Um, but once the client contacts the program, this is the typical um, disaster case management process for that client. So first, there's screening or intake that's done for the program to assess general eligibility. Now, this might happen over the phone. So screening might be more about understanding the household's needs and vulnerabilities um, and simply ask if the person was affected by the disaster. And then the actual verification of that um, disaster connection would come later in person. Um, if there are multiple disaster case management agencies, there might be a helpline or a screening agency that's in the lead that performs this screening or intake work for the entire program, which could encompass multiple agencies. Sometimes the person needs urgent information or referrals, and that can be done at that initial stage of screening and intake. Um, sometimes that's all the person needs to recover, and they actually don't have to go on to disaster case management. But if they do need additional assistance, they would then get assigned to a disaster case manager or be put on a waiting list if um, the need outweighed the uh, capacity. Um, 
And then once the disaster case manager makes contact with that client, they would conduct a comprehensive needs assessment, which would include verifying eligibility, like I spoke about, via documentation. The purpose of the assessment is to understand how the household was living prior to the storm, how they were affected by the storm, what they've done so far to recover, what disaster benefits they've received already, and what outstanding needs they still have and resources they could still potentially access. Disaster case managers then help the client figure out what types of benefits and services they might still be eligible for and help the client set realistic goals for their recovery. They formalize this partnership through the creation of an individualized disaster recovery plan, which details the goals, objectives, and tasks that the client and the disaster case manager uh, will take in their work together. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Along the way, disaster case managers provide accurate and timely information, they make appropriate referrals, and they help their clients access services by assisting with applications, by advocating where necessary, assisting with appeals, presenting cases to potential funders like long-term recovery groups or Amit Needs Roundtables. Sometimes they case conference with their supervisors, um, colleagues, or partners. Um, and that's sometimes needed to figure out how to best utilize the resources for a particular client or to advocate for certain resources to be formed. And then when the work is done with that client, hopefully because the recovery goals have been met, but sometimes there are other reasons like loss of contact or the person moves to a different state or you transfer the case to a different program or sometimes the program ends even when there is still need out there. Um, but then the case would be closed. You can move on. Okay, so there are many similarities between disaster case management and general case management. So um, the process that I just outlined from outreach all the way to intake, all the way to case closure is very similar um, from what regular everyday case managers do. Um, and both disaster case managers and general case managers provide information, referrals, and advocacy to their clients. There are also similar skills that are needed by both disaster case managers and case managers alike. They both need to know how to engage their clients, how to keep them engaged. They need to know how to assess needs and vulnerabilities. They need to know how to help clients set realistic and manageable goals. They need to document their work sometimes on paper and sometimes in a database and sometimes multiple places. Um, they need to communicate with their clients, with their colleagues, supervisors, and funders, both in writing and in person or over the phone. They need to know the resources that are available and how to access those resources, and they need to understand and respect confidentiality rules. There's also a similar structure for supervision where disaster case managers and case managers alike aren't working by themselves in a vacuum, but they have access to a supervisor or a supervisory figure who can provide guidance to them on cases, can approve case assignment and case closure, can monitor their work, can assess their training needs and their self-care needs. And actually, I didn't list this, but the importance of future sustainability is also very similar. Um, we hope that through disaster case management and case management, we can bring clients out of the crisis that they're in to a place where they can provide for their own needs ongoing or connect to services that can help them do that. Um, oftentimes, this sustainability is needed um, to obtain financial assistance. Um, and the need for budgeting and financial literacy is essential to that process. So there are also many differences between disaster case management and general case management. So um, each disaster might bring a different population with different demographics to the forefront. So it's really important to understand who the affected community is and what the dem demographics are for that community. Because you might have to tailor your disaster case management program to those needs. Um, for example, my agency currently runs a disaster case management program for hurricane evacuees who came from Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands to New York City. Um, and at least half of our clients speak Spanish. 
Um, so that means that we have to ensure that all of our forms and letters are translated into Spanish and that all of our disaster case managers can speak Spanish fluently. That's imperative to this particular program. But we've never had that experience where all of our disaster case managers had to know how to speak Spanish before. Disaster case management programs are time limited. This is typically based on the funding source. So for example, in a federally funded program, that can last up to two years with the possibility of an extension. But usually there's a timeline set to whatever that funding source is, whether it's a private entity or um, local, state, federal government, um, there is a time limit. Disaster case management programs are scope limited. So we are only working with people affected by that particular disaster. The eligibility is based on that disaster connection, not necessarily on income. So there's a very diverse clientele regarding their previous finances and their connectedness to public benefits. As Zach mentioned, I was a disaster case manager for people affected by 9-11, and some of my clients made more money than I could ever dream to make. But that didn't affect their ability to have a disaster case manager, and some clients have never needed to ask for help before and have never been on public benefits before, so they really needed extra assistance in navigating those systems if they lost their income or even if they just had a lot of expenses after the disaster. There are unique mental health considerations because by the very nature of the program, all clients will have experienced trauma in the form of you know, loss because of this disaster in some way. They may have lost community, they may have lost a loved one, they may have lost income. Diane talked about all of those different ways they can be affected. The data we collect in disaster case management programs is very focused on pre versus post disaster situations, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in some of our upcoming slides. General case management programs usually do some type of goal planning, maybe you call it a service plan, um, and in disaster, this is the crux of our work, and we call it a recovery plan. There are disaster-specific resources and concepts and acronyms that you probably wouldn't ever need to know or ever hear outside of a disaster case management program. And disaster case managers need to be extra flexible because needs and resources may change rapidly in a disaster. Um, it can change multiple times a day at first, and then it might change every day, and then it'll slow down a little bit, but things come and go. Sometimes there's um, resource deadlines that pop out of nowhere, and you didn't find out about something until the day before it's ending. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of change. So you have to be extra flexible to handle that stuff. Next. So I mentioned confidentiality. Now the concept is the same. Um, you can only share personally identifying information, sometimes that's PII is called. Um, you can only share that PII data with another individual or agency when the client agrees to that via a signed release form. So some of the forms we use are a general release form for an agency, um, and some programs have to fill one of those out for every single entity you share with, while others have a release form that allows you to release to multiple agencies that are listed in that form. We have um, a consent to release to FEMA, and we have a CAN release form. That's the database that Diane talked about earlier. Um, so those are some of the typical forms you might see in the disaster case management program related to confidentiality. We say that a verbal release is okay, but only if there is an urgent need and you have no way of getting a written release in time. So an example could be it's already 5 p.m. and there's a resource deadline tomorrow at 10 a.m. And there's no way you're going to be able to get a signed release form from someone, but you can call that person and you can get them over the phone to tell you, yes, I agree to your release of information for this thing. But then the next time you see that person, the disaster case manager would get the signed release form just to have it in the file as a backup. And they would make sure that they document the interaction that happened over the phone, that this person gave their verbal consent. Even when there is a signed release form, there are still a few things to think about. You want to make sure that you're only telling people uh, that need to know. 
so a need-to-know basis, you're only telling them the minimum they need to do their job. You should always be keeping files in locked cabinets and not leave them unattended. Even if someone takes a really short five-minute break to walk and get something, you should be locking those up so that no one can see what's inside. You want to use a case numbering system on your files and whenever possible when communicating. And you want to think about email encryption if that's necessary. Um, so sometimes to get around the uh, need to have encryption, you just never uh, provide clients PII data in email communications. Um, you don't include their names. Um, maybe you only include their, that case number that everyone in your program would know about, or maybe that this other entity would know about. Um, so those are some ways to get around email encryption. But other agencies have really strict confidentiality guidelines. Some are bound by HIPAA, uh, and so they might already have encryption in place. Next. So this is a sample intake pre-screening form that we use in our current program. Um, and it outlines some of the data that we collect in disaster case management that you wouldn't collect in a reg regular general case management program. So first of all, if the person is an evacuee, you want to understand when they arrived in your city. We mentioned the CAN database, so you would want to keep track of whatever CAN ID number is assigned. Or if there's another database you use, keep track of that number here. We want to know about the property that was affected by the disaster and whether that was the primary residence um, and also if it was used for business purposes. This is important because most resources only help with a primary residence as opposed to a vacation home. Um, and if the home was used for business, that might open them up to additional business services and resources that could be applicable. We want to know the current address, the current contact information, as that might be different from the pre-disaster um, address and contact information. You want to know uh, what the, an emergency contact is, and this is especially important in disaster uh, because people affected by disaster often move, sometimes multiple times. Phones get disconnected all the time, so it, it's really helpful to have that emergency contact. We want to know what types of assistance they've applied for, if they know their case number, and what the status is. This is especially important in federally declared disasters because there's often a short window of time to apply and or appeal decisions. Housing is usually affected by disaster, so we want to understand what their housing plan is if they are currently in temporary housing. The household members may have changed if housing was affected or someone lost their life, so it's important for us to understand who was in the household before, who is in the household now, and who might be planning on coming and staying permanently with that household. They may all be different. And it's important to understand the vulnerability factors in the household because although disasters don't discriminate initially, it is people who are the most vulnerable who have the hardest time recovering from disasters. And those are typically the people that we see in disaster case management. Next. So this is a sample assessment form. These are the first two pages of our form. Um, I think the next couple pages are on the next slide. Um, so during the assessment, we're getting a picture of what a client's life was like prior to the disaster, and this is their baseline. We're also learning more about their current situation, how they were affected, what they've done so far, and we also want to know what recovery looks like to them, what their expectations are for recovery and for your services. We're also getting more detailed information from the client on their pre-disaster housing, their current housing situation, and their plans if they're looking for temporary or permanent housing. Sometimes people affected by disaster have several temporary housing situations, like they could be living in a public shelter at first, and then they're couch surfing between a friend or a few friends or family members. And sometimes temporary housing is something that the client ends up living in for over a year or several years, but we still call it temporary because that isn't the plan for their permanency. For example, um, in New York City after Hurricane Sandy, um, we had some clients who were staying in temporary rental housing while their disaster damaged home that they owned was being rebuilt, and that took several years. Um, there are still people 
to this day, even though the disaster happened in 2012, there are still people now who are in temporary housing that are waiting for their homes to be rebuilt. And it's really important for us to understand all of those temporary places and the trajectory that they went through for the past several years after a disaster. Um, regarding their current housing, we want to know if they're in shelter or if they're doubled up. We want to know how much they're currently paying in rent. We want to know if they have a rental subsidy. Um, this often starts the conversation for budgeting uh, because we're starting to learn about what their expenses are and what income might be coming in. So Diane talked earlier about the sequence of delivery, and it's really important for disaster case managers to know what the client received so far, how much they received, what that assistance was intended for, and how they used it. This is especially important in federally declared disasters because there are typically caps of assistance and there are strict duplication of benefits rules. Um, duplication of benefits it's where you can't get funding from different sources for the exact same thing, the exact same purpose. Um, so an example could be if a person was moving into a temporary rental apartment and say it costs $1,500 a month, which is actually on the cheap side in New York City, um, they can't get $1,500 from FEMA for first month's rent and also $1,500 from Catholic Charities for first month's rent but they could get $1,500 from Catholic Charities for a security deposit and use that $1,500 from FEMA for first month's rent. So even though it's the amount of money, they're using it for different purposes. Um, and fraudulent activity in disa declared disasters is, al is also cautiously monitored. Uh, so after we find out about all the assistance the client has received so far, then we can see what they still need to recover from the disaster, and that's their unmet need. And this, this doesn't have to be a monetary calculation that we make, uh, but it could be it could include goods and furniture and clothing and other things that make up um, resources. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on what all of these um, federal resources are. You can look them up on disasterassistance.gov. If there are specific questions about them, I can answer them later if we have time, but I just wanna make sure that we get through everything. Um, and I also, um, I'll give this to you, Zach, to send out to everybody, but I just wanna make sure everyone knows about all of the really amazing changes that happened at the end of last year in the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018. Um, or DRRA. Um, so um, that really changed, that came out of nowhere and I was not expecting it. And it changed um, maximum amounts that were possible through FEMA and we'll send you all of the details on that so you have it. We can go to the next slide. So recovery planning again is, is similar to general case management if you have a service plan. Um, but in disaster case management, we call it recovery planning, and this is where clients participate in the development, implementation, and ongoing review of their individualized plan uh, for time-limited tasks that help guide them uh, in achieving realistic goals for their recovery. And a good recovery plan can really help reduce the client's stress and turmoil because it's giving something concrete for them to do. It's restoring some of the control that they've lost over their lives. And these are some of the important aspects that we make sure are in a recovery plan. So the goal and the objectives, which are the smaller steps to reaching those goals. Um, the goals typically we think about in maybe three month terms just to make things a little bit more manageable um, and realistic for clients to achieve. Um, the action steps are even smaller than the objectives and they have to happen to reach those objectives. And this includes the who and the when. So the responsible party, which is either the client, the disaster case manager, or both of them, and the target date for when you want to, to achieve this or when it's realistic to achieve this, or if there's a deadline, when it has to be achieved. The outcome is whether or not it was completed, not completed, or partially completed. 
And then the completion date, which obviously is when this that half was completed. Um, and then the signatures are so important. This has to be signed by the client, the disaster case manager, and the supervisor. And then when the plan is updated or if it's amended, new signatures should be obtained every time. Next. So disaster case management is not therapy or counseling. Communicating and listening is obviously an important part of disaster case management, but if a disaster case manager is spending most of their time on the phone or in person with their client, listening to that client vent, or you know the client is tearful at every appointment, then the disaster case manager needs to be making a referral to a mental health program or a crisis counseling hotline. The DCM relationship should be focused on achieving goals, setting goals, achieving them, making referrals, getting answers, getting things done. That's, that's the task at hand with disaster case management. Disaster case management is not medical care. That's pretty obvious. But if a client talks to a disaster case management about medical issues or health concerns, again, the disaster case manager should be making appropriate referrals and help the client access health care. And DCM is not a magic bullet. Just like general case management, we can only help clients as much as they want to be helped. The client has the power to make their own decisions, and we can certainly provide our own professional opinions and talk about consequences of certain actions, but we can't decide for them. We can't force the client to do things that we think are best for them. So they have agency, uh, they have, they're empowered to make their own decisions. Next. Okay, so sometimes, this transition. Julianne, yeah. I know we, we, we didn't plan to pause there, but I, I think we just got through a lot of really foundational sure. content about the the provision of case management, kind of the essentials uh, that are included throughout that that journey of intake all the way through the client recovery plan. And we have had some uh, at least one question come up here. And so I think we'll we'll pause here for a quick moment for that and any other questions folks may have. Uh, William Firestone, I see that uh, you have a question here submitted through the chat feature. I'll unmute your line so you can ask it. Uh, it's a common challenge that a lot of folks experience, so you are not alone in that for sure. Your line is unmuted, Bill. All right, looks like Bill's uh, unable to uh, speak up through the audio feature. I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it on his behalf. He wonders, have you had experienced, uh, experiences rather, with the necessity for multiple databases that don't talk to each other? Requirements <laughs> for CAN, requirements for your regular casework, um, maybe another database that's required for DCM program, in other ad hoc programs that come online throughout that recovery process uh, that necess necessitate significant data entry time. Thank you. Joanne Dan? Yeah, yeah I definitely do. Um, so sometimes there are databases that particular programs use in just general everyday work. Um, and then the disaster happens and they're doing a disaster case management program. We've, we've talked about the importance of using a coordinated assistance network, which allows multiple agencies who are doing disaster case management work or recovery work um, for this particular disaster. It allows them to see what's happening with a, a particular client. So that tells us, you know, if someone is working with someone else um, or if they've received something from someone else, we know not to duplicate benefits or efforts. So, um, in my experience, my agency, um, we do have our own database, but when, in disaster programs, we actually don't use that database because we know that we should use CAN, and so we just have our case managers enter data into the CAN system, um, and then we report from there. Um, so I haven't experienced a lot of... I actually, I haven't had much experience with multiple databases that had to be used. We just, as an agency, we made the decision not to use ours. Thanks, Julianne. Dan, anything to add? 
No, I agree with Julianne. Same in Colorado. We didn't, uh, we only use CAN. We did not put the information into our regular database. I know um, our our partners um, down in Beaumont, they 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 use both, they use DART. I think they check CAN and they also enter it into their own database. So I think everyone's just a little bit different. Certainly not the first time I have to run through that uh, there, Bill. Um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes there's a lot of data entry associated with the provision of case management, which often you know, there, there will be funding for, at least it's a, it's a federally reimbursable expense to have a data entry um, person as part of a federally funded program. Um, so sorry for interrupting, Julia. It looks like that's all the questions we have at the moment. Uh, no other hands are raised, and we'll just go ahead and uh, continue. Yep. Okay, so how do you actually transition? So sometimes the transition happens very organically. So maybe you're providing casework at a MARC or a disaster recovery center, or maybe you're just providing your typical general case management services at your agency offices. But then the demand from the affected community is what warrants the need for longer term disaster case management. And then those conversations happen and decisions are made in real time. So sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes funding is approved at the city level, state, federal level, or through private dollars, and your agency gets some or all of that funding to do disaster case management. Sometimes that happens because of conversations your agency has been having with those funders, and sometimes it can seem like it comes out of nowhere <laughs> without your agency's voice at all, and then you're tasked with doing this. Um, maybe RFPs have already gone out pre-disaster in times of blue skies. Um, sometimes MOUs or contracts might already be in place um, in your area. And so there's already a documented plan of who the potential lead agencies are for disaster case management and what that trigger would be um, for those who are leaders in, in the disaster case management fields in your area to activate and to get funding. So sometimes there are plans in place. It all depends on what's going on in your area. Um, so some of the things that you need to consider as an agency are the needs of the community. So how many people were affected? What are the demographics of that community? What's the scope of the damages? How big is this disaster? And um, the priorities of those families if the need outweighs the capacity. So sometimes uh, in the program that we're currently running for a hurricane evacuees, we're seeing this, um, where we actually haven't been able to hire disaster case managers as we thought we would. Um, so it's been really difficult, which has slowed down the progression of our program. And so we had this, you know, influx of need. We did intakes and pre-screenings with 200, 300 people, and then we couldn't refer them for a disaster case manager sometimes in several months. So we had to start prioritizing. Um, so who needed to be seen right away? Who had an urgent deadline or an urgent need that needed to be addressed? Um, or there was a resource that was ending and like they could only access this resource for a period, of, a short period of time. Those were the people that we really saw um, needed to be prioritized first. Um, you need to think about your agency capacity. So do you have staff you can use that are already on your staff? How long would it take if you had to hire new staff? Do you have the structure in place and the fiscal capability to pay for services that might not be, be reimbursed for many months or might not be reimbursed at all? If you hire new staff, do you have space for them? How long will it take to order computers and phones? Who does that? Are they ready? All those things. So um, you also want to think about the other agencies involved, the coordinative mechanisms, the funding streams, the resource landscape, and that will depend on the size and scope of the disaster and whether it's federally declared or not. Outstanding. And, and just real quick here from a Catholic Charities USA perspective as well, if any agency ever finds themselves uh, considering taking on a privately funded or a state or federally um, funded disaster case management program, uh, both Julianne, uh, Diane, and then as well the, the disaster operations staff here, uh, Kim and myself and Simona and Dottie, 
Uh, we've all had experience in, in helping support agencies through this transition, deciding uh, how big they want their footprint to be, what, what can they handle if they've got the initiative to go ahead and do it, what can they expect. And, um, you know, we're, we're happy to do that for any agency who finds themselves in that situation. So as you go through the coming slides and all the triggers and considerations that, that you'll need to work through, this is obviously not the only time you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and think through these things. And I uh, just wanted to speak up and share and let you know that that's a resource at your disposal. And if there happens to be a second collection that the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops undertakes, if a long-term RFP is issued from Catholic Charities USA as a result of that, um, you know, those funds uh, can be used to help cover unfunded expenses that you may incur through provision of disaster case management. Because um, we're all about the same thing, seeing resources go the farthest they can and, and having clients get help. So I uh, just wanted to share that real quick as, as Julianne continues. Thanks, Julianne. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because my agency has benefited several times from Catholic Charities USA funding as well. Um, and I would say that you are one of the most um, flexible funders that I've worked with, that's for sure, um, in terms of just you know, b being willing to modify the the purposes based on the needs that we're seeing or even the amounts sometimes, like you said, if a second collection is taken, you might have more to give. Um, so CCUSA has been a great resource to us. Um, okay, so there are, when you do actually transition to disaster case management, there are a lot of ob objectives that you have to meet to get the program underway. You want to develop a plan and protocols for transitioning from your regular services to disaster response and recovery. In New York City, we have a lot of players and a lot of government players as well. So my agency's plan is typically to see what is being done, to see what is asked of us, and to fill in the gaps. But you might be the biggest agency in the game in your area, so you might have to make a very clear decision about what you can do and when you can do it. So you want to think about those things now. When would you get involved? Is there a trigger or a threshold that needs to be met? What services would you provide? What is your eligibility criteria? Does income matter? Those are the kinds of things that you want to start thinking about now. If you're running a standalone disaster case management program, or even if you're taking on a managing agency role, overseeing the work of multiple agencies that are doing disaster case management, then you need to have case file forms and program protocols in place, like plans for data collection, reporting, quality assurance, program evaluation. You want every disaster case manager to be providing the same level of services, and so you have to have standards built in. Yes, you can create them when the time comes in real time, but that might delay your supervise, uh, that might delay your program, um, and it might you might be building the plane while flying it, and it might seriously overburden your su supervisory staff who have to be creating all those plans. But they should really be focusing on the day to day operations and supporting their staff and thinking about clients rather than developing all these forms and protocols. So develop those forms and protocols now. The great news is that you don't have to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. So there are lots of templates available through CCUSA that Diane's going to talk about shortly. With, regarding staffing, you might utilize existing staff, or you might hire, hire new staff, or you might have a combination of the two. So you should develop job descriptions now. You should think about which programs you could be pulling from if the time comes. So typically those who do general case management have a great transition into disaster case management. We've also noticed within our own program that um, our refugee resettlement staff are also very well suited for this um, disaster work. And you want to get your human resources department involved in planning for a surge in the need to hire staff. When disaster case management staff is in place, they need to be trained and they need to have all the tools that they need in order to do their job. So this means the case file forms, the actual case files, um, the office space to meet with their clients and to document their work. They need office supplies, they need equipment. 
So you want to develop those orientation training materials now. And again, there are existing tools you can use. And you want to involve your facilities department, if you have one, in planning for surge in office space, supply needs, equipment needs, um, anything that would have to do with needing more space or having more um, staff in your programs. Disaster case management staff will need to know the resources that are available to their clients. You could make each of them do their own research and make their own connections, but that's a really inefficient process. You want to engage resource providers on a program basis, and that can encompass several agencies if you're all doing the same work. You could work together and engage resource providers on that program level so that every disaster case manager has knowledge of and access to the same resources. And you want to develop those relationships now. So if you aren't involved in your state VOAD or your local COAD, then you want to join them today <laughs> or tomorrow. Um, once the DCM program is functioning, you need to address ongoing training needs and self-care needs of your staff. So develop mechanisms to capture those needs. Some things that we've used in our programs have been training surveys, especially when we have, I mean, we've had up to like 200 case managers in a program before. So blasting out training surveys has been easy for us in, in the, those situations. Um, you could also have biweekly or monthly supervisory meetings where every time you meet, one of the agenda items is talking about training needs and self-care needs. And so there's always a space every two weeks or every four weeks where the supervisors can be communicating that to you. And finally, you want to learn from all of the things that went right and all of the things that went wrong. So develop mechanisms to capture those lessons learned from your program. It's really hard to remember everything at the end so build in the time during the program to stop and reflect on what's working and what isn't. So for example, what we did when we were the managing agency um, for Hurricane Sandy, um, we had regular team meetings of the managing agency staff. And we, like every six months or so, um, our director at the time had the wherewithal to stop and pause and make sure that at our team meetings we were talking about things that were working, things that we wished we had, things that we wish we knew. Um, and so we documented all of those things along the way. And at the end, we turned that into a lessons learned document um, to really document all of, uh, as, as it's called, to document all of those lessons that we learned. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, and so now I'm going to transition back to Diane, who's going to talk about some of the checklists and the job aids through the Catholic Charities USA network. Thank you, Julianne. So again, um, as Julianne mentioned, when you're in the midst of a disaster or even ramping up your disaster case management, there's so many things for agency like case managers and for leadership to think about. And it's really easy to, for some of those details to fall through the cracks. So again, uh, Catholic Charities USA has checklists for leadership and case managers. And there's a myriad of form sets that are available for disaster case management. We've said before, just don't reinvent the wheel. That's a waste of your energy and um, you're gonna need it. So preparing for the agency for the transition, um, some of the checklists to think about is establishing a broad message for, for your Catholic Charities agency. What do you want to communicate to the client to avoid mixed messages? Um, Julianne talked about protocols, but where do some, some of the protocols and phone numbers for communicating to the public how and where Catholic Charities assistance is available? Um, you should be establishing internal lines of communication and reporting. And again, we've talked about this before, establishing those partnerships and relationships with the community, with your FEMA vows, your um, other NGOs, and again, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having that relationship with your VOAD. And then, again, determining who who else is doing um, providing services out there from FEMA and other agencies and other state agencies and even other volunteers. So 
So additional checklists that are available is helping to conduct that community needs assessment. Um, you know, before you even start disaster case management, you really need to figure out what are the demographics and the impact and, you know, what are the needs from the disaster for the community and really who who's being affected by this disaster? You know, is this um, the most vulnerable population, which oftentimes it is, you just need to get a really clear picture of who who is out there and who needs the assistance. Um, it, again, it's so important to really obtain and provide staff copies of all those required forms. Um, and it's even good to have those at the response uh, portion as well. You may not have long intake forms, but you should kind of have in mind what are some things that we could be collecting while we're responding that could help us in the recovery phase. And um, should also be top of mind like what type of practices are you going to have as an agency for working with individual and group volunteers? Again, you'll have a onslaught of people definitely during the response phase who are um, big hearted and you know they want to come in and help. And sometimes that can be a disaster within a disaster. So just some of those checklists are helpful to make sure you're thinking about all those things. So now we're going to talk a little bit about briefly, uh, you know, Julianne talked about the entire disaster case management process. So you're doing all this work. Uh, so where do you put this work? And it will be in a case file, but what should that case file contain? So it really depends. It depends on the size of the disaster. Is this a federal or non-federal disaster case management program? And are you dealing with a declared or a non-declared disaster? You know, some of the possible, and I really emphasize possible because, you know, again, depending on uh, some of those factors that I just mentioned, you know, you may have a very thick case file or you may have a thinner case file. Um, here's going to be a list of about 40 different forms. And let's just highlight a couple. Um, you know, some of the releases are going to be in your form set would be a can release media release form is very, very important. Um, sometimes if you can have the disaster survivors agree to sign a media release form, it's great to be able to tell your stories to your board, to donors. Um, it's just really important. Um, rights and responsibility forms, grievance procedures. Um, financial verifications. This is just a snapshot of some of the forms that would be available. Really the crux of it in the disaster case management process is the intake form, that initial assessment, you've got your damage assessment, your disaster case management tier levels, not everyone's going to be a tier one client, and also um, some eligibility determination forms really to figure out if the people that you're working with are eligible to receive disaster case management. More forms, of course, eight notes, uh, tracking forms. The point of all this is there's a myriad of forms and we can help share them with you. Um, even towards the end of closing up the program, whether it be a transfer, a closure, you know, and, and really to wrap it up on this portion is the importance of a client satisfaction survey, which we should go once a case is closed. Um, you know, we're always trying to improve programs and our services to our clients. And again, recommended case file packet can be found by accessing the CCUSA member uh, page under disaster operations. All right. All right. Thank you, Diane and Julianne. Uh, we did want to make sure that folks uh, are aware that we are continuing to add to our tools and resources at the members portal. Uh, the Catholic Charities USA website uh, for members only section is, is where you go to access that. And uh, this webinar is really based on a, uh, a video training and an accompanying guide with Word and PDF checklists and forms like Diane uh, just kind of ran through a lot of those forms uh, that you would need to build as part of case file to help equip uh, you as members uh, to do the important work of uh, disaster, uh, all things disaster, in this case, disaster case management. 
Uh, so as you can see, that, that leads us to our wrap up here. And I'm sure there are a number of folks who may have some questions. Um, I'm not seeing any here in the chat uh, features. Uh, so go ahead and raise that hand if you'd like to raise uh, a question uh, for the group uh, to hear and uh, have addressed. One question while we wait to see if any hands go up uh, that I would have for uh, our presenters here would be what surprised you uh, when you first undertook uh, leading uh, from your, your vantage point uh, disaster case management program in your respective areas? Hmm. Julianne, you want to go first? Um, if you have something you want to share, you can go first. I have to think a little bit. <laughs> well, I think um, this is Diane, and I think what surprised me most was, um, I think maybe the word surprise would be more like what what did I wish I knew kind of towards the end when we uh, wrapped up our program. I wish I would have known more of the players, and I wish I would have taking advantage of more of the network experience. And um, I, wish I, would have, I wish I would have been able to think about tapping into um, so many of my, my other partners. You know, I kind of felt like, we, we felt like we were just in it all by ourselves. It was the first time in FEMA Region 8 that they had a DCMP program. So I guess I was surprised about so many things that I learned after the fact, which I think I've, we could have saved ourselves a lot of headaches had we participated in a training like this and tapped into our other network partners. So that's kind of what surprised me. Sure. Um, so I've been in this field for a long time and I have been a co-chair of our New York City Disaster Case Management Committee at the New York City BOAD level for since 2009 um, and so I think what actually surprised me is that um, we had a lot of things in place already even if they weren't written down necessarily but we as an agency really knew um, who to talk to what you know what tools to use or um, I had a lot of experience and so from from previous experience as a disaster case manager and so we actually had a lot of internal knowledge um, that we utilized for running our programs um, when we were chosen as the managing agency for Hurricane Irene and Lee that was back in 2011 um, that was the first time that the federally funded disaster management program was happening and so there wasn't much guidance from the federal level at that point there wasn't a federal program guidance yet um, so we were really in charge of like making all of the forms and um, in making decisions and knowing what was right for our clients and those kinds of things. And so I, I was surprised that there um, that we were allowed <laughs> to have so much um, input into those processes and and those forms. Um, what else? I now in our current program, I mentioned this earlier, but what I'm most surprised about in our current hurricane evacuee program is that we are having a really hard time hiring case managers, um, disaster case managers. So this program started, um, I'm going to say we had our first orientation back in October of 2018. And at this point, we're probably only 60% hired, um, which, again, I was not expecting. And so you know, we had to really um, scale back on our outreach um, and we had to just focus on the clients that were already on our waiting list. We had to prioritize people. Um, we had to make some exceptions to that 35 best practices rule for case managers, um, which I didn't even talk about. But um, there is a best practice where each disaster case manager should have about 35 cases. Um, and that would be a mixture of cases that are really active, uh, very vulnerable, and a mix of people that are, you know, moving towards closure, um, or maybe think ones that you haven't even contacted yet or been able to, to con contact yet. Um, 
but so we've had to do a lot of, of scaling back the outreach um, for the program because of that, which surprised me. No, oh, thanks, Julianne. And, and just hearing you say that there, the well, there is now formal guidance uh, that uh, FEMA has a nice toolkit uh, that gets updated as, I mean, you mentioned the DRRA um, legislation, uh, you know, so as new changes happen, they update their guidance. Um, but at the same time, and this is not a knock on, on FEMA's guidance, uh, particularly on like reporting aspects, the, at least on the re reporting side, uh, fi financials tend to be a lot more locked down and involved and uh, tedious. But, um, you know, there still is a lot of room to navigate. You know, you're making a lot of judgment calls when you provide case management services. Uh, these cases, as anyone who does social services uh, can attest to, can be quite complex and messy. And it tends to be no one knows this program. Uh, when I say program, I don't mean a formal, I mean the, the act of providing disaster case management, whether it's federally funded or not. Uh, better than service providers. Uh, that's something we continually hear from our federal colleagues and from other people in the sector. So know that you are in very good company if you've never had to do uh, the act of providing disaster case management, whether it be with a staff of three case managers or, you know, Julianne scaled up to 200 plus. Um, you know, as long as you have the desire to help clients and want to stand in solidarity with your community, uh, and, and do what you do best, uh, providing those social services. Uh, it's a different type of case management, but it's still case management. Uh, then you can handle this. Uh, you'll have support from the network. You'll have support by way of resources. You'll have support from CCUSA. And, uh, you know, your colleagues at, at FEMA, should they end up funding that program or even the state, um, everyone's in it together. Uh, they want to see clients get help. So, Hopefully, uh, this webinar today uh, demystified some of the aspects of providing disaster case management and uh, gave you a leg up in confidence and resources and tools uh, to go ahead and, uh, you know, participate either as a lead or, um, uh, what am I looking to say, a sub-provider agency in the provision of disaster case management. Uh, at this point, I do not see any other questions, uh, so please join me in thanking uh, your presenters, Julianne and Diane, uh, for just a, a wonderful job today. Again, this is recorded, so look for this to be posted uh, later next week, as well the PDF of today's presentation is available within the GoToWebinar um, functionality, so you can download that, save it, uh, and you've got it right there with you. Thank you so much for attending, and now uh, we're going to go ahead and close the webinar. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, your Wednesday.